Aloha friends and welcome to today's video. Today is June 24th, 2021 and we're having our full moon in Capricorn. So you know the drill. Get out your little notebook, look at six months ago for the new moon in Capricorn and look at 12 months ago for the last full moon in Capricorn because the last full moon in Capricorn was a partial lunar eclipse. So there were some big endings that happened around 4th of July last year and it, it, it could be said especially when you look at a chart like this like this like a thema mundi oriented chart where you have cancer in the first house it could be said that the way that we looked at authority really changed last year on that around that lunar eclipse so i wanted to bring this chart up because this this full moon, I feel like, is is preparing us for this particular configuration, which is happening on the 30th. So this, these lines that I'm trying to trace right here between Saturn and Chiron and Uranus, they're in the sky even right now part, as part of this full moon. But this square over to Mars, that is forming next week. So I feel like the full moon in Capricorn is saying, okay, we need to prepare for a, a, an ending again with regard to how we deal with authority and not just authority, but also the devil's advocate. I really look at Capricorn as being a devil's advocate type process. Uh, how can I detach myself further and further and further to get this is kind of like to bring myself into this almost like witness consciousness of, of impartiality. There's a lot of benefit that we get from being from, from making decisions and assessing situations from an impartial position. And that is the role that I heavily pick up on coming from Capricorn. And so that's what this full moon is saying is like the full light of awareness of what it means to be impartial so that we can take a look at this configuration and this configuration right here, Saturn opposing Mars is really a push pull between someone just trying to achieve something and someone trying to make sure that whatever is being achieved is actually important and vital and not frivolous. Saturn despises anything that's frivolous. So there's this push pull between people trying to make things happen and Saturn trying to make sure that they're not frivolous, that they're actually vital, that they're important. And Uranus is coming in making this tension saying, but I just wanna do things in the moment. I have my finger on the pulse. I I feel the beat and I just want to dance to the beat no matter what happens. I mean, that's half monster babies. Let's just, this is the moment. Let's see what we can create. And Saturn is like, no, no, you can't just, you can't just be creating whatever you want. And so now I want to tie Chiron in, right? So the myth is, here's the mythos. Uranus is the father of Saturn. Uranus, because he's just creating in the moment, he can, he'll create half monster babies left and right. Loads of them. He was creating them hmm, by the load. And Saturn castrated him. He said, enough's enough. We, we only need what we need. And Saturn had seven children. Saturn had Jupiter. Juno, Poseidon, aka Neptune, Pluto, Vesta, and Demeter. Demeter? Six. Those are the Olympians. Ceres or Demeter? The same person. I can't remember which is Greek and which is Roman. And then he had a seventh son. His seventh son's name is Chiron. 
Now, I found that really interesting that he had six planned children with Rhea and then a seventh son that was a rape of a sea nymph. And he abandoned his child. But I keep pondering Uran, not Uranus, Saturn. And I just sense that it was planned. It was planned. Uranus doesn't plan. Saturn planned this rape. Saturn planned to have Chiron. And then if you look at the actual orbit of the planet itself, it's Is this a good one? This is a good one. Okay, here you go. You can see that Chiron almost touches Uranus's orbit and it comes within Saturn. So my thoughts are that Chiron is almost reconciling what happened between his father and his grandfather. Uranus is just trying to create in the moment and Saturn is trying to structure things so that only what's actually important remains. And Chiron is saying, well, if you do that too much, you'll never have anything new. And what fun is that? There's, there's, there's no, there, you can't have that. You can't have too much restriction. So Chiron is almost like Saturn's way of bringing back his father. Chiron, Saturn was able to bring back the energy of Uranus through Chiron. And he had to abandon Chiron in order for Chiron to be able to do what he's here to do. He's here to bring unique electricity that comes from being in the moment in a structured way. He is the wounded healer. He's healing the wound between Saturn and Uranus. So my thought then wonders, I wonder about, I wonder about the fact that there's that myth of Chiron going and taking Prometheus's place. My thought on that is that Prometheus and Epimetheus were the ones that stole the fire from the gods, the Olympians. See, that's the thing. Prometheus and Epimetheus were titans, the uncles of Jupiter, and they stole the fire from Jupiter and gave it to man. Jupiter took a Prometheus and chained him to the rock, and he gave Epimetheus Pandora, who ultimately released all the evils upon the world. And yet Chiron goes and replaces Prometheus since he can't heal, he's immortal. That's what everyone says in the myth. So my thoughts are in a symbolic way Chiron represents the energy that replaces or usurps simple forethought. So what is forethought? How do you turn forethought into something 
better than what we had before. Maybe the forethought, forethought somehow before, even though it brought us fire, it brought us so much pain from all those things coming out of Pandora's box. But maybe Chiron is showing us that even though the pain of rejection, even through the pain of rejection, we can still bring magic. That is, you know, that's what he did. He brought magic. He brought the healing arts. He brought herbal arts. He he was the one that made the poison, invented the, the recipe for the poison that was on the arrow that struck him, that mortally wounded an immortal being. So it's it's interesting. It's interesting. I am still working on these thoughts. I'm still developing how this fits in with the mythology. And I'm still tapping into the underlying tones of motivation behind the myth. But this myth of Chiron reconciling the dispute between his forefathers, it's related to this transit. Thank you for listening.